Yep. So you know how that should be um, but, So what we'll do, yeah, I mean... Hello, hello, hello. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be underway shortly. We would appreciate it if you could try and move down and occupy the seats at the front and in the center of the auditorium.
Ladies and gentlemen, please come in and take your seats. We're going to start in about another minute or so, so please come in and take your seats now. Come on and have a seat because we are going to try and start as close as possible to on time. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for getting here on time. It's going to be a really worthwhile discussion, I know. Good morning. My name is Donna McElligot, and I am the host of Alberta at Noon on CBC Radio 1. And it is my great pleasure to be here with you today as your moderator. I would like also to say before we begin that I am grateful to our teachers who are educating our future leaders in this province. I'm a proud parent of a junior high student in Alberta's public school system. And <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and I would also like to thank our six candidates because it takes courage, determination, and tremendous dedication to run for office. All six have served this province in public office, and a couple have even been teachers as well, and devoted enormous time and energy to make this province a better place. It will certainly be interesting to hear their plans for Alberta's education system, especially since one of them will be our next premier of this province within the next month and a half. Here is the plan for this morning. Over the course of the next two hours, we will focus on three areas of education, transforming the system, paying for it, and the future of the teaching profession. We'll also have some time for some questions that the delegates have submitted on other important topics. But we will begin with opening remarks from each of the candidates, and I am going to keep everyone strictly to time. That's the business I'm in, and I'm going to stick to it, and we only have two hours today. So 
Let's begin, and the speaking order has been determined by a random draw. Our first speaker is candidate Ted Morton. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Donna. Thank you, ATA. Thanks for inviting all of us here. I apologize we're dragging you into a cave here when everyone would rather be out hiking uh, and enjoying the great day, but hopefully the rest of the day will be there for that. Uh, everybody up in front of you today recognizes the importance of education to the future of Alberta. It's a cliche, but it's true. Uh, our children are the future of Alberta, so it's a priority. It's obviously a priority for parents. Uh, it's also a priority for employers, and it's, an, it's a priority for each one of us up here today. Uh, I am a teacher. Uh, my wife was a teacher. Uh, I taught at the University of Calgary for 24 years. My, my wife taught in uh, Calgary Public for 13 years. So why did we become teachers? Because we were inspired by teachers we had when we were in K-12 in university. So we recognize, and I recognize, that after parents, teachers are often the most influential people in young people's lives. So I know what you do, I respect what you do, I value what you do. And if I get the opportunity to become Premier, I look forward to a positive and constructive relationship with the teachers and with the ATA. You've helped make Alberta have the best K-12 education system in all of Canada, one of the best in the world. I want to keep it that way, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ted. We'll move now to Doug Griffiths. Thank you very much, Donna. I am so excited to be here. Um, Today we are officially launching our new website, betteralberta.ca, and the first policy we're rolling out, which will be available at 1101, is on education. And the reason why we've done that is because this is the launch of the official six-week hardcore campaign, and education is our number one priority. For those of you who don't know, I grew up on a ranch out in Coronation, and we had 200 head of purebred Black Angus cattle. And I loved doing that. I loved ranching. But I got my teaching degree as well, and I loved teaching more than anything else. In fact, I taught grade five and six social, grade three to nine math, five to nine science, six to nine phys ed, and six to nine computers. <laughs> and believe it or not, that wasn't over my career. That was in one year. <laughs> I taught in a small school called Bymore where we had a lot of double and triple grading and I'll tell you from that experience I understand how critical education is to the future not just of the province but of every single community in this province and I personally understand just how important teachers are to the lives of our students. My kids are five and two and when I talk about the future of this province I talk about how important education is going to be and I know that nothing is going to set a better course for my kids than the education they're going to get while they're in kindergarten right through to post-secondary. And that's going to determine the future of this province too. So I'm very excited to be here. I know uh, we're, I'm going to have a chance to flesh out some other ideas for you as we go along. And, and uh, thank you for taking the time to listen to us all. I know you're listening to Liberals tomorrow too. And it's important because somewhere, whether we're one of us is Premier here in the short term, uh, one of any of the parties could be premier and you've got to make sure that whoever we choose makes education number one. So thank you, Doug. Rick Warman. Thank you very much. Uh, I uh, want to echo what uh, Doug has just said about uh, the uh, process of selecting leaders for uh, the Pro Progressive Conservative Party. It's unique in our jurisdiction. Uh, probably anywhere in the world, to have so many times selected a leader who then becomes the premier of our province. So it is incumbent upon every one of us to assess which of the candidates resonates with you, stands for your values, your morals, and the one that you believe should take you into the next decade. So I just encourage you all to make sure you participate. You know, it's very easy uh, to complain about uh, actions of government. There are six people at this panel that uh, decided that rather sitting on the sidelines that they would participate in a dialogue and, and uh, frame discussions around where we need to go. I set out uh, three priorities in my campaign. Uh, the first is accessible health care, and the second is excellence in education, and the third is safe communities. 
Um, and I told the AUMA, and they were quite puzzled. I said, you know, health care should be your top priority as well. Uh, and I said, because if we're having health care grow at 6% and our economy grows at 3%, it's an unsustainable model. And uh, with the growth in health care, if we don't check it, if we're not more efficient with use of taxpayer do taxpayers' dollars, we will have things that happen the last tax go-around, and that is schools that were promised were cancelled. So sustainability of our health care system is in the best interests of educators, it's the best interest of the public school system, and it's also in the best interest of health care. So, uh, I, uh, I am, uh, had great opportunities to have discussions with teachers and principals about uh, their views. My view is resources in the classroom. That's all I really have to say in terms of where I want to go with my education policy. So I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Allison Redford. Thank you, Donna. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you for inviting all of us to address you today. My name is Allison Redford. Very quickly, my bio. I'm married to my husband, Glenn, and together with my daughter, Sarah, we live in Calgary. But I've lived and worked all over the world. I've lived in Afghanistan and South Africa and Bosnia. I've lived in a lot of places where democracy was fragile and where economies are at best developing and where our opportunities are extremely limited. But not here. We have a strong democracy in Alberta. We have an economic engine that is powerful. And our possibilities are limitless. And that is why no matter where I go, I've always come home. And for the past three years, I've been the MLA for Calgary Elbow. And until I stepped down to run for leader of the Progressive Conservative Party, I was the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General. I'm not a career politician, but I was in Cabinet for three years. I know what's worked, and I know what hasn't worked. And I think I have some understanding as to why it hasn't worked. I have a track record. I've worked on safe communities. I've worked with nine government departments, and we've thought differently about how to solve problems. We've developed partnerships, we've broken down silos, and we've built partnerships that have really made a difference in Alberta. And I will say that one of the partnerships that I'm most proud of is our partnership that we've had with the police. We're reducing gang violence, and we're preventing domestic violence. We're putting prevention programs in place and we're identifying kids at risk, whether in the, they're in the healthcare system or in the education system. And I want to have this type of strong relationship with Alberta teachers. The Safe Communities Initiative was a foundation for consultation, and consultation leads to trust, and trust is what will allow us to change and to make change and to trust each other in that change. I think inspiring education was a very important step. As a consultative process, I feel strongly that it worked well. However, I will say that as a trust-building initiative, it failed. Without trust, we cannot create the change that we all want to make for kids in the public system. In safe communities, we had a plan for change, and that's what I bring to this race. I bring to this race a plan for thoughtful change. We have a plan for change in education. Inspiring education... Allison, thank you very much. Thank you. We go to Gary Marr now. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I don't purport to have the same kind of teaching experience that Doug Griffiths has, but I can say that vicariously through my wife Nancy, I do have a great appreciation for what it is that teachers do every single day. Now, uh, of all the portfolios that I've held in government, education was the most important and one of the most interesting. Because for me, it's about future prosperity. That the future prosperity of our province rests not only with the mining of the resources that are under the ground, but also the resources that rest between the ears of our young people. And education is absolutely critical to creating economic opportunities that will allow our future to continue to be a bright one. Uh, my family has called this province home for over 100 years. My grandfathers came to make a better life for themselves and for their families back in a time when this place was still called the Northwest Territories. I want it to be our family's home for the next 100 years. And in order to do that, I want to make sure that our kids, Lauren and Jared and Mackenzie, uh, all of whom have gone to school in the Edmonton public system where Nancy teaches, uh, I want to make sure that they have the knowledge, the skills, and the attitudes uh, to be able to compete in a competitive world, and not only to have the advantage of having one of the best school systems in Canada, but one of the very best in the world. And it's one that I've talked about in the United States, uh, where there's been tremendous issues with respect to education. So 
I've come home, and I'll say this, you don't know how good things are at home until you've been away. And so I've seen lots to compare it to, and I know that working collaboratively with teachers, there's much that we can accomplish. And whatever challenges we have, they are, to my mind, solvable. And I thank you for the work that you do every single day in our classrooms. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Doug Horner. Well, thank you very much, and uh, good morning, all. And as Ted said, what a beautiful day, what a beautiful place to be having, I think someone told me your 63rd conference, 52 years of them here. Wise choice to bring it here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, every one of us is touched by a teacher. Every one of us, even at the podium here, has teachers who are in our families. My brother teaches and taught in Grand Prairie, and I'm surprised at how many people came up to me today and said, your uncle was Uncle Marvel, right? And how many of you, I don't know how many of you taught with him or worked with him, but um, it's a little bit scary to me. There's only two degrees of separation in Alberta. The reason, <laughs> the reason that I'm doing this, and because we only have two minutes, I'm gonna be brief. The reason I'm doing this is I was talking to a young teacher in Glendon about two weeks ago. And he was telling me how he teaches his kids what progressive conservatives' values are. And I asked him to tell me what he thought they were. And I didn't like the answer I got. The answer should have been, we're compassionate, we're innovative, we have integrity, and we have a commitment to excellence in everything that we do. That we want to lead on a world stage with Alberta, and we want you to help us do it. We have to, as Allison said, recreate the trust, the bond between us. Because the reality is we both want the same thing. We want success in the classroom for our kids. And you can do that for us. But we have to give you the tools to do it. And that means that we need to change. We need to change the way we make decisions. We need to change making our decisions through the lens of dollars and dogma to the lens of those values, compassion, innovation, integrity, and commitment. Thank you very much, Doug. Okay. Oh, sorry. Go Good ahead. You have a few more. You have, a, you have more time, Doug. Go ahead. I do. Okay. Good. Thanks. No. I'm <laughs> I got my iPad here at the timer. It was only 146 and the low. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I believe that the change Albertans wants is exactly that, for us to change and to work in partnership with the people who are going to create the future for our province and the future leaders for our province. And that's you, and that's my commitment. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. And I'm glad I gave you that extra 15 seconds because we're talking about the future now in the next part of our discussion. We're talking about transforming the system. And this is a question that each of the candidates has had time to consider and prepare their thoughts on. And they'll each have two minutes to answer and then we'll uh, uh, mix it up a little bit. The question is, Alberta is world renowned as a top performing jurisdiction with regards to public education. What do you think of the system today, and what are your priorities for change that would help ensure continued excellence? First, to Doug Griffiths. Well, thank you, Donna. Uh, I gave this a lot of consideration, and I know that we brag a lot uh, about how exceptional our education system is. We have one of the best education systems in the world. But being a teacher, I know that the success of a student in the classroom usually depend, depends 95% on the teacher in the classroom, not much else. That's the most critical element. So if you're going to, which means we don't have the best education system in the world, it means we have the best teachers in the world. So if you're going to continue to improve our education system, I pick three areas where I think we need to focus. The first is to make sure that we have the best professional development still going forward. We have exceptional professional development, but we need to put resources in partnership with the ATA to make sure we have the best professional development for our teachers, so we have the best teachers always in the classroom. The second one is to make sure that we maximize the tools available for teachers in order to make sure that they're doing the best job they can in the classroom. If you don't give the tools to the teacher, no matter how good that teacher is, it's like asking a carpenter to build a house without giving them a hammer. Teachers need the tools in the classroom to make sure that they maximize the growth and development of our students. And the third area we need to focus on uh, for teachers is to make sure that some of those issues, and we all know what they are, that creep into the classroom that affect the students' learning, whether or not they had breakfast in the morning, whether or not the home is a good environment, those sorts of issues, the teachers have the resources available to deal with those. And 
address them right away so that they can go back to focusing on making sure they're the best professional developed people in the world and to make sure that they utilize all the tools possible to improve the education for our kids. Those are the three areas we need to focus on. We could talk about computers and stuff, but if we start with the teachers themselves, I think we'll continue to have the best education system in the world. Thank you, Doug. Rick Worman. Thanks, Donna. You know, there, there are a series of things I think that we have to focus in on. Uh, the first is that we have to be able to make sure that we attract top-notch educators to our public system. And uh, that comes through attracting, attack, attracting uh, top-notch educators in our post-secondary institutions. It starts right there. And predictable, long-term funding for our educators, uh, I think, is, uh, is key. The other thing is we have to focus on classroom pressures. What are the pressures of the teachers? I've talked to teachers. They've said, look, uh, we're, our first responsibility is to make sure that every student that comes through our door, whether they have language challenges, whether they have learning disabilities, uh, whatever their challenge, the teacher needs the classroom to make sure nobody gets behind. So for me, Top priority in education is resources in the classroom, and I think as government, we have to make sure that school boards are dedicating resources to make that happen. I think it's also important uh, to recognize that uh, teachers aren't police officers, and they're not social workers. And so when you talk about resources outside the classroom, we have to make sure that, that the support is there, again, to make sure that as one of the principles of our party, is deliver excellence in education. So we have to make sure the things we do reflect, uh, reflect those principles. Uh, predictable funding, leading edge new technologies, and uh, you know, for me, I think it's also incumbent upon government to work with the teachers and the school boards to make sure our parents understand what our teachers are doing, make sure they understand what their challenges are, and. Uh, and be sort of less critical and more supportive and more, have more input. So I really think that's, you know, when I look at my uh, children, my grandchildren, I see that uh, that's something that needs to be provided. Thank you, Rick. Alison Redford. Thank you. We have to go back to the values of what we want education to be, not just what it's been in the past and funding it better. Of course we have to do that. Two months ago I talked about long-term and sustainable funding in education. But now the question becomes how do we work together to get to where we need to go next? We have to change the way that classrooms are working. We have to give you the tools to be able to do the work that you want to do. And we have to understand that a lot of the work that you'd like to do now isn't work that you have the opportunity to do. It's going to involve changing curriculum, and it's going to also involve identifying kids who need to be given better employment options and better opportunities, and then resourcing programs that are going to allow those kids to have the options that they want to have. I agree with Doug and with Rick with respect to what happens in a school. And as a community, we have to understand that schools are much more complicated now than they were 20 years ago. We know that at this point in time, we need to build partnerships with other agencies and communities. We've had some success in doing that, and we have to think differently about that, be bold about it, and understand that that work happens both inside the walls of a school and outside the walls of a school. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. <laughs> Gary Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the uh, main objectives, if I were to try and think about what the big picture was for education, it would be to have a system that ensures that our kids are privately happy and publicly useful. And in order to do that, uh, that means giving resources to, to teachers to be able to teach our children not only curriculum, but knowledge plus skills plus attitudes that will allow them uh, to succeed in the future. Core to that is stable, predictable funding, so I think that all of us would agree with, uh, with that particular issue. And also something that Rick talked about, that I've talked about a great deal as well, is that in the observation of Nancy, she's a great teacher, my wife, uh, but she's not a cop, she's not a social worker, uh, and she's not a, uh, not a nurse. And so to wrap around services uh, around those kids whose needs go beyond mere educability within the classroom uh, is really, really important. I've also learned that with respect to change, that we can't change things without deep engagement with our most important stakeholders. So my experience as a minister is not so much uh, something that I'm talking about what I've done in the past, but what I've learned from those experiences. 
And we can change curriculum, but only uh, if we have the ability to be deeply engaged with stakeholders like teachers. We can only have success if we've got parents that are engaged uh, with uh, being involved in, in the uh, support of their children at home. We, we must look also at early testing for kids to determine what their needs are and get those needs dealt with as quickly as we can uh, rather than fishing kids out of the water who have learning disabilities and allowing two more to float past, we should be getting out of the water and walking upstream and seeing how they're getting in in the first place. As Dr. Fraser Mustard would say, you can pay me now or pay me later. I would rather invest early uh, in dealing with learning disabilities, uh, issues like ESL, dealing with those up front so that educability of students that are in your classrooms uh, is easier. And I'll Thank you, Gary. Thank and you. And we'll go to Doug Horner now. Well, <clears throat> thank you. And I opened my comments with saying we should change the way we make decisions. And one of the things that I think we have to change is we have to start planning for outcomes. Let's talk about outcomes together in partnership. Partnership with you, with industry, and with parents, and with society as a whole. And then let's fund for the outcome that we're trying to achieve. You know, we, we start again at the dollar all the time. Let's separate out the labor component of what we're doing. Let's deal with that together. But then let's also fund the outcome. So does that mean that we want to have healthier kids that have maybe a low population school vision that says you're going to have a registered nurse in the school to help you, to help the kids, to help the families? Does it mean that we're going to have uh, family counselors in the school to help you, help the kids, help the families? I mean, let's start talking about where we're going to go with the outcomes. Let's measure it, but let's measure it in partnership together. You know, the PAT exams, we should remove the... the, the, the <laughs> let's move to... Let, wait, 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 wait. I'm running out of time again. <laughs> Let's move to a random sampling. We're going to get the same statistical outcomes. We're going to get the same thing. Now, let's do it on the, let's do it on the grade three, but let's take a look at how it works. And then let's talk about grade six, and then let's talk about grade nine. Again, in partnership, build that trust. Let's bring society back to the table in education and make sure that you have partners in the homes that are helping you with the kids. Let's try to create that value. Let's not change the curriculum unless you're ready for it unless you've been involved in it, and start so that we can move forward with that. When I look at the outcomes that I want to have for our education system, it is to lead on the world stage, and I agree with Doug. We've had great results. We've had great things to stand up and crow about. But the reality is we all know that there are better things that we could do, and we could lead on a world stage. We could create a system that the rest of the world comes to see, how did you do that? How are you guys competing so well on the global stage with those other students? That's Thank you. What we need to change. Thank you, Doug. Let's go to Ted Morton now. Ted. Thank you, Donna. Uh, I agree that uh, professional development and classroom resources are key to continuing success. But I think we should begin by repeating what others have recognized: that we do have one of the best performing uh, K to 12 systems, not just in Canada but in the world, and and. Uh, certainly I and I think everybody up here recognize the importance of teachers in that. But when I look at, at my, my experience both as a student and a teacher and I say what's been the key to my best learning opportunities, it comes down to sort of the enthusiasm and the connection and enthusiasm between teachers and students but also in K-12 to uh, parents as well. There's kind of a triangle there. And I think one of the keys to the success in Alberta has been the principle of choice and diversity in education, the, the Catholic, the public, Catholic, private, and now the charter system, uh, has created that uh, chemistry of enthusiasm that matches uh, interests between teachers, students, and, uh, and, and parents. Uh, you know, Doug mentioned we'd like to have a system where people come from around the world to look and see what is the key to our success. Well, in fact, we know, particularly in the Edmonton uh, public system, people have come from around the world to look at that, and the key has been that element of, of choice. So I think we have a good system. We have to work hard to keep it uh, good and better, but I would, I would go to the structure that, that creates that trilogy or that, that chemistry between teachers, students, and, and parents that I think is the key to continued success. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. And um, you get the first response to the follow-up part. And, and um, 
you were talking about choice in the system, and this question is about choice. It's from Mark, who's a grade five teacher from Edmonton, and he says, this government promotes charter schools as a place where innovation and enhanced education take place. Alberta students are among the top performing in the world. Innovative and enhanced education is taking place on a daily basis in classrooms across Alberta. What is your view of the role of charter schools and to a further extent, private schools in Alberta's education system? And Ted, you get the first response to that. Yeah, I mentioned charter schools for a reason. We happen to have, be fortunate enough that we have friends whose daughter and son-in-law are teaching in one of the charter schools in Calgary that focuses on uh, performing arts and, 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 and visual arts. And we also have friends who have a daughter uh, in that school. And so we've, we hear from both sides, from the uh, teacher side and from the uh, parents and student side. And one of the reasons I emphasize that enthusiasm or the chemistry, because that's what I hear. That's what we hear from our friends, that both on the parent side and on the teacher side and on, uh, on their child side, there's great enthusiasm for the curriculum. The, the parents love the teachers. The teachers love the kids. So I, I, again, I think that choice is, is critical. And in terms of uh, the, the instructional subsidy for uh, private schools, uh, I support that as well. Uh, I think what is it? Do you, do you support also funding following the student, Ted, in the private system? Well, that, I think that's what I'm saying. I think right now there's a 65% instru instructional subsidy. Uh, those parents pay for, uh, you know, obviously pay the same taxes that uh, everybody else does. So, yes, yeah, so I do support that because, again, I think it creates the diversity, the choice, and the enthusiasm that uh, has been one of the key contributors to Alberta's success. Thank you. And Doug Horner, how would you respond to Mark's question about charter and private schools in the system? You know, I'm, uh, I am also a big believer in choice in our, in our system. And uh, as a parent, uh, my choice was to put my kids through the public system. My, uh, yeah, my, uh, my upbringing, I went through the public system. I have a great deal of faith in the public system. And I think if we funded it appropriately and dealt with the other issues that we have, uh, within that in terms of the resources and those sorts of fundings. We get away from this discussion of, well, you're stealing from there to put into here. Let's make sure that we're funding, again, for those outcomes and you don't have that discussion. But choice is important because I want our kids to actually have an education. I don't want them to not have that education because they didn't feel that they were impassioned by the school. And there's a number of our charter schools that the kids have a passion for whatever that the charter school might, might have, that helps them learn. Why would we take that away? I think it's important that we ensure that we're funding the public system so that we can get the outcomes that we want and that we have choice within the system. But what about on the private question, Doug? That's, that's part of the choice. I think the level that we have today is, is a good level of, of uh, <coughs> uh, both private contribution and public contribution. We don't do any contribution to the capital side of it. That, that should remain the way it is. Uh, but again, if, if we can get kids educated either through the private, the, the charter, or the public system, that's the goal. It's the outcome that I'm after. I understand that, but just to clarify, and I want to clarify with both candidates just so that we're all on track, we all understand here, and then let uh, the others weigh in. But on the question of private money, we're hearing from some other um, political parties that uh, perhaps certain kids should be allowed to opt out of the public system and let that public money follow them to a private school. Ted, Doug, do you agree with that idea? Ted first. No, I support the system that's been in place in Alberta, I think, since the late 1960s, where a percentage of the instructional cost, uh, I, think it's, I think it's 65 percent, uh, goes to 50, 55? 70, 70, okay, 70 uh, percent does follow, does follow the student to the private school. And I okay. think, it, again, it, for the reasons I explained, I think it creates the chemistry, the choice, and the, uh, the, the support from home uh, that is, is critical oh. to student success. Okay, Let, let's bring in some of the other candidates. Um, what are your feelings, uh, ladies and gentlemen, about the idea of charter schools? Doug Griffiths, you're a teacher. Do you think there should be more charter schools in the province of Alberta? Well, uh, before we get to that question, I think the bigger point is that public funding should go to support public education. 
Now, my notion of charter schools is that it's a place where you can experiment with education with different teaching styles. Private schools are where parents and students decide they want more focus on issues, but those should not be supported by public dollars because everybody has the right to a public education and that's the government's responsibility to fund. If someone... If someone makes the choice to go to a private school or a charter school, then I think they make the choice to pay for it themselves. Thank you. Rick Orman? I actually uh, basically support some of what Doug Griffiths has said for a different reason. I mean, you know, in the system, this is, you know, we talk about public, public funding, it is taxpayers' funding. And for me, it's important that parents have choice. There's, just, there's accountability in the education system, whether it's public or private, and that the, the, there's a consistent curriculum. Now, on the issue of funding, I don't believe funding should follow the student. Uh, I do believe, I have actually surprisingly talked to two, separate, two different uh, uh, members of boards of directors of uh, private schools, and actually both of them said, we don't need the funding. We don't need the public funding. And I got the sense from them, and so for me, so for me, um, if that's the choice that they make, that they don't want to access public funding, I don't think they should be forced to take the public fu funding. I think there's a sense, though, I think there's a sense, though, that the government wants some public funding inside the private system, the Department of Education, so that they can control some of the aspects, like curriculum and some other matters, so there's an element of control there. So I actually think it's time to have a review of that. Thank you very much, Rick. Allison, how would you respond to the idea of a public and charter school, private and charter schools. I, I remember when charter schools started to arise and we saw a difference in Calgary and Edmonton with respect to the rise of charter schools and my impression just as a citizen of Alberta was that one of the reasons that we saw that difference is because in Edmonton we saw a board that was prepared to respond to what teachers wanted for their kids and we were able to see a public school system that was able to build and grow and develop in a way that was responsive to what uh, taxpayers and citizens and parents wanted. Uh, for their kids' education. Uh, in Calgary, we didn't have quite the same uh, experience, and I, and I think for some period of time, there was a higher percentage of charter schools than, uh, than uh, in Calgary than in Edmonton. I think what that speaks to is that we're not creating a public system, that it's allowing uh, you to do the work you want to do, but also parents to feel that they're getting the services that they need. And what I'm quite concerned about right now is that we could very well see with the continuing development of private and charter schools, the public system being considered to be a second tier level of education. And that can't happen. Thank you, Allison. Gary Marr. I'm most focused on the outcomes, and what I want to make sure is that we prescribe as a province, uh, in collaboration with school boards and with teachers, uh, curriculum that we believe is important for kids to have success. And it focuses on reading writing and arithmetic, of course, numeracy and literacy skills are quite important. But so too are uh, issues with respect to the kinds of skills and attitudes that children have that we think are important collectively for our society. Uh, there are some debates with respect to, you know, who should be able to deliver this? And there are some in Alberta who would say we shouldn't have a Catholic school board. I'm not as concerned about whether a child is taught curriculum that we prescribe, whether it's by a public school, or whether it's by a Catholic school, or whether it's by a charter school, or by a private school. So with respect to private school funding, I think that, as Doug says, the balance is about right. Uh, we have to recognize that not all kids learn the same ways, but the reality is, is that the overwhelming majority of parents choose the public system. And that is a choice that they make consciously. Uh, and, uh, and so it bespeaks of the kind of work that is being done by our public system. And when I say our public system, I also mean the Catholic School Board as well. Gary, uh, we're going to continue the discussion on uh, financing uh, with the next question. And uh, the first responder will be Rick Orman. And um, here's the question. A number of grants for school boards were reduced or eliminated in the 2011 budget. As a result, hundreds of teachers across the province were laid off in June. Will a government under your leadership 
reverse grant cuts to school boards and what principles will be used in the future to ensure stable, predictable, and sustained funding for schools. Rick? Well, I think that uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that uh, the public, not just uh, the school system, is angry at, uh, at this government is because they have been unpredictable and they have been unreliable. And uh, I think it's, uh, you know, let's start with, with things that have been cancelled that were promised, like grants. How about uh, freezing teachers' salaries in the middle of an agreement? You know, we can have these panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen, are connected with this government, have made some decisions that ad adversely affected the education system. And I think it's important that you hold them accountable for that. And you ask those questions. How do we explain the last five years in the education system? My, I also think it is, it is offensive for any of us or any leadership candidate to commit or talk about funding outside of a budget cycle. We have to be mindful that taxpayers expect us to make decisions in the context of the rest of the province, the $35 billion that we take in. And uh, it, it, I guess it would be glib for the ones, for the programs they cut or eliminated for them to say they'd, they'd put them back in. The question is, can you trust the actions of the people connected with the existing government? My government will be clearly in a, in, uh, it will be clearly mandated to live up to its commitments, make promises, whether it's to the education system, their health system, and live up to it. If we can't make those promises, if we can't live up to those promises, I'll make you one promise here, we won't make them. So predictability and stability so you can do the job that you do best and that's teach. You shouldn't have to worry about these other issues, about is the funding going to be next year, do I have the classes? resources in the classroom, are there going to be schools cancelled that were promised, not acceptable, and in a Rick Orman government you will not see that. Thank you, Rick. Alison Redford, how do you respond? Thank you. First of all, as, as I said earlier, uh, when I announced my education policy over two months ago, I talked about long-term, sustainable and predictable funding. It's got to be a value of where we go in the future. But that's just really table stakes. That just gets us in the door. If government negotiates a contract, honour the contract. If we're, going to honor the con if, we're not, if we're going to honor that contract, we don't then go to school boards and say, well, we want you to renegotiate the locally negotiated contracts. You have a vision for education. You make the commitment. You give the people who are participating in the system, you as teachers, parents in the system, and school boards, the certainty that they need to have to make the long-term plans. If we don't have vision and we don't have the commitment and we're all not agreeing to go in the same direction, we're going to continue to have the kind of problems that we've had in the past two years. And we can't afford that anymore. We can't let it happen. We have to rebuild that trust. We have to change the relationship that we have with you. And you have to understand where we want to go as a government. And one of the ways that we will do that is to ensure that we make that commitment. And the question as to how to guarantee that is to have a premier who makes the commitment to do that and ensures that his education minister follows through. Thank you, Allison. Gary Marr. My education policy does talk about the importance of stable and predictable funding uh, because from my perspective you cannot plan unless you have uh, some sense of what your funding is going to be at, at the very least on a three-year horizon. So my view would be that uh, school administrators, uh, school boards, teachers themselves who are part of making up those plans uh, need to have stable and predictable funding. I go further that it's not just in the education area but I would say the same thing about uh, other important areas uh, like health care, uh, like um, municipal, municipal governments. They all require the same kind of stable and predictable funding in order to make plans. And that's how you avoid circumstances where you're announcing new schools and then on the same day uh, having uh, teacher layoffs. So uh, I would also make this point that uh, we do have to review our education funding framework from time to time. In my policy, we've uh, talked about doing it on a five-year basis, and the reason for doing it every five years is to ensure that the funding throughout the province uh, continues to be equitable and it continues to be consistent. As we know, there are different circumstances in different parts of the province. Uh, and we have to recognize that there are uh, differences in sparsity, and, dif uh, sparsity and, and, and distance, or with respect to the number of kids that you have who have learning disabilities. Nancy would tell me that, you know, it's not sometimes the issue of how many kids are in your classroom, 
But if five of them are in your classroom that have a profound learning disability, that is already too large a classroom. So the idea that we recognize those differences in different parts of the province in our uh, education funding framework is important to me, uh, important for you, and one that we can, must continually uh, update from time to time uh, to recognize uh, the differences uh, throughout the province. Thank you, Gary. Doug Horner. <clears throat> Well, this is a perfect example of what I'm talking about when we talk about changing the way we make decisions. If the Minister of Education is given a target, the first, the first thing that he's told is, here's your target, and that target is 3.5% or whatever it might be, because you're trying to achieve a dollar amount as opposed to an outcome. You've just made half the decisions for that minister. The other half is, how, it, how does he get underneath the target? And many of us have had that challenge in our departments in the past, and that's one of the frustrations, one of the reasons why I'm running. We have to change the way we make those kinds of decisions. We have to say, do we value education? Yes. Then let's value the outcomes, and let's fund to those outcomes. Yes, stable and predictable, but what is the stable and predictable? Is it 4% a year, and we say that's it? I know, that's not the way we should be doing this. We should be saying, here's the labor piece, separate that out, let's negotiate that in good faith, let's honor whatever that ends up to be. Now we're done with that. Now let's move to how do we fund what you need to achieve the outcomes, as I said before, that we all want. And then let's build the budget around the outcomes, not build the budget around the percentage. Because that's the thing that we've been doing. Thank you, Doug. Do I have any more time? You do. <laughs> Go ahead, Doug. Okay, don't clap until I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> no breathing. When, and I, I do agree with Gary that there's, there's differences in the funding model that we have to start changing too. I mean, we talk about the, uh, the occupancy of our schools and you include the gym space and you include all these other things. And then we say, there's the size of the school. It's because we want to have this, this total accountability. We have to move away from that. We have to start saying, we're building for the future of this community. And by God, it might have to build a little bit bigger today because you're going to fill it. We're going to build for the future in terms of the teachers that we're going to hire. We're going to build in that. So you can't just say it's stable, predictable, and this is the percentage you have to build for that future. Low population schools. Maybe it's not classroom space you're building. Maybe it's clinic space. Maybe it's ADAC space. Maybe it's space for a family daycare. Mm -hmm. Why aren't we looking at those things as outcomes instead? Build the funding around it. Let's stop talking, starting at the dollars. Let's start talking about what the outcome we want. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Ted Morton. We, we all recognize the importance of uh, stable, predictable, long-term funding for uh, a well-functioning system. And I think all of us uh, supported the, uh, the five-year contract that was uh, negotiated back in 2007. Of course, in 2007, none of us saw what was going to happen in the next uh, 12 months in terms of the global economy and the recession. So we got caught uh, as a government between the contract we signed and with the, uh, the dramatic drop in revenues that occurred uh, uh, in 08, 09, 010. And we're, we're still, of course, running uh, three, $3 billion deficits. So the, uh, I think in the future, I would still support trying to do the long-term contracts. We want to make, maybe make them a bit more flexible to accommodate uh, un unforeseen or unpredictable changes. It's, it's a little hard to know what the heck the, uh, the new normal is anymore with what's happened in the last 10 days. But I would go back to, uh, would many of you remember, back to the mid-90s when uh, my wife and I both took uh, the 5% across the board uh, cutbacks to public sector uh, compensation. Uh, I don't want to go back to that. Uh, that was not easy for us. I, I suspect it wasn't easy for a lot of you. So I think, again, beneath the school funding piece is sound, sound fiscal management. And I, I can't believe anybody here wants to go back to what we experienced in the mid-1990s. So I, I can promise you uh, a Ted, Ted Morton government uh, will have sound fiscal management and there will be no none of that across the board public sector cuts because there won't be any debt that pushes, pushes us into that hole. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Doug Griffiths. I have to admit, I find it a little bit frustrating right now uh, to listen to some people talk about changes to the funding formula, which I've been advocating for nine years having been in the system, and now they're willing to make the changes, but they were sitting at the cabinet table then and didn't make the changes. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, 
I have said uh, long, for a long time now, I know that Premier Stelmach used to say that selling bitumen to the United States uh, raw is like selling the topsoil off the farm. Cuts to education are like selling the topsoil off the farm. It affects all of our future over the long term. So uh, we do need to reverse the cuts that were made. There's three significant changes on top of what's already been mentioned that need to be done. First, our budget cycle is poor when it comes to education. We, we get this reputation amongst my colleagues that education is always coming back and asking for more money. And the reason why is because we budget in January, and in September when we have more students than the new school year and we have to ask for more money, it, it's set up wrong. It's budgeted to our cycle, not the school cycle, so it looks like education always asks for more money, which is poor and gives us a bad reputation. The second way, we need community-based funding. I'm not big or supportive of funding following the student. When I was a teacher in Bymore, we lost three students. We lost $15,000 out of the budget. And we couldn't sell any desks or sell textbooks or turn the lights off earlier. And finally, if we're going to have stable, secure funding in education, we have got to make sure that we make some smart and probably uh, challenging discussions and decisions around our own revenue sources and streams so that we don't subject every other department to these vicious cycles that we don't do us any good in the long term. Thank you very much, Doug. And the follow-up uh, question speaks directly to your experience as a teacher uh, in rural Alberta, Doug, and it's from Kellyanne, a high school teacher from Medicine Hat. She asks, what actions and policies do you believe are needed to help preserve the quality of rural education? What changes would be necessary to create a more equitable funding model for rural school divisions? Doug, you get the first response to that. Uh, so I'll talk about a couple of them. Uh, first, I, I mentioned it briefly, I'm not a fan of funding following the student because in our small schools, like Bymore, for instance, when you lost three students and you lose $15,000, there's nothing you can do to change the way the school operates. So we have got to go back to a model where we fund programs and not fund per student so that we make sure that the integrity of the education in every single community in this province, all 422 of them, is whole and has integrity. The second thing um, we need to do is go back to community schools, not just on the funding model, but understand the importance of them to the whole success of a community. When I wrote the Thanks. when I wrote the rural development strategy for the province, the rural community development strategy, I pointed out that there are four pillars to any community having success. There is education, number one. And it's not just kindergarten to grade 12, it's kindergarten right through post-secondary and access to it. Healthcare, jobs, and then community infrastructure. And so an integral part of the success of any community and its future is its school. Because if you lose the school in a community, it's the, school, the community's done. Mm -hmm. So it's our responsibility with 422 communities in this province to make sure they all have an opportunity to succeed. And providing that education and that stability will make sure that the people in that community, the families and the kids, will be part of a prosperous Alberta in the future. Thank you, Doug. And uh, Ted Morton, you get the next uh, response. Yeah, I would, we have a small schools program. Uh, I think it's doing a pretty good job. If we can do a better job, uh, I'll certainly support that. Okay. And uh, will any, any of your colleagues like to weigh in? Allison, go ahead. Thanks, Donna. I, I heartily support what Doug Griffiths has been saying with respect to community schools. Because as I said earlier, what we'll find is not only the opportunity to sustain and to develop communities, but more importantly to provide the services and schools that we need to provide. And one of the challenges that I think we have is that many of the policies that uh, Infrastructure Alberta has put in place with respect to school size, uh, uh, square footage, hallways, gyms, that sort of thing, as has been mentioned earlier, starts to define education policy. And in the past two or three years, what I've seen is that we seem to think that driving the infrastructure agenda is what will inform other sorts of policy in government. We have to think differently in government about who takes the lead in policy development, and we have to understand that decisions that will be made about long-term education policy need to be made by, inf by education and not by infrastructure. Rick Warman. 
I agree with Allison. You know, uh, this question should not have to be asked. Uh, we have a principle of our Conservative Party, and it is excellence in education. And that means excellence in education for educators and students on the banks of the Hay River and on the banks of the Milk River and every, anywhere, everywhere in between. And if there is skewed funding that is not creating that environment, then we as a provincial government are not doing our best job. I think it's absolutely important that, uh, that we rededicate ourselves and make sure that, that, that driving excellence is not being driven or not being deterred by some of the things Alice talks about, and that is uh, other departments or other agendas. Uh, we have to all pull in the same direction. Question Doug, about that. Thanks, Rick. Doug Horner? Well, thank you, Don. As uh, Minister of Agriculture, it was my uh, great pleasure to actually implement the Rural Development Strategy, and part of that was to try to figure out how you make rural communities economically viable. One of the things, and Doug has mentioned this, one of the things that people look to when they come to Alberta to earn their living is that they want to look for a place that they can live where they can get a good opportunity for the kids to get educated. They can have good health care. They can have recreational opportunities. They have arts and cultures opp cultural opportunities. When you think about some of our low population schools or our rural schools, that can be the place. I don't want an Alberta where you come, you make your money, and you leave. I want an Alberta where you come, you make your money, and you achieve your dreams, and you make your history here in this province and become new Albertans. To do that, everywhere in Alberta needs to have those opportunities. And that's why I said, let's look at the outcomes of what a, what a low population school could do for us. What else is required in that community? It isn't about just saying the education budget has to fund it. Why don't we look at what mental health needs are in that area? Why don't we look at what family needs are in that area? Why don't we look at some of the other needs in the area and bring them together and create a community center that, oh, by the way, is also your community school? Let's make that work, and then you're going to be able to achieve the success that you're looking for. You're all talking about um, paying for the education system and making it fair and keeping communities vibrant in rural areas where populations are shrinking. Um, you've also talked about not wanting to have to revisit the budget if things go south in the economy. But what do you do? Do you all agree that the funding formula needs to be changed? I, I know that Doug Griffiths does. Can I just get a show of hands? Does everybody, who, who agrees that the funding formula needs to be changed in the province? Well, I mean, you've got to review it. Okay, and, okay, so may I ask you, Ted Wharton, because you do not agree that it needs to be changed, but you also believe that things should be budgeted properly so that you don't need to revisit in times when the economy is bad. So what would you do in a situation where you don't have the money? I mean, you don't like across-the-board cuts either. Uh, so um, what would you do in, in, how would you address, for instance, the situation that exists now with the teachers where... Every, where we, we've seen the layoffs, if you, I mean, you're not the finance minister anymore, but what if you, I mean, you have inside information to how you can manage these crises. How would you do it in a way that is right for the education system? Yeah, I, I, as I said, I, I think I support the, uh, the long, longer term contracts, such as the one that we signed in 2007, because uh, it gives the stability, the predictability that uh, will support uh, better outcomes in education. But I think given what we've learned now with the un unexpected uh, turmoil in, in the economy and the $5 billion drop in government revenues that have ensued, that there has to be some flexibility in those types of contracts because we've gotten cross-pressured now between keeping up with building new schools, which I know all of you want, and honoring that contract. And I wasn't part of those negotiations. I guess none of us were because we were... Uh, for those of us who were in cabinet ha had to resign, but there were some negotiations and I know they were constructive up to a point between the ATA and the government about trying to find some, some compromise or some, some accommodation so we could keep building schools. Uh, but I think that's, there has to be that partnership and that, that's what I said. I look forward uh, to a, a positive cooperative relationship uh, with the ATA uh, trying to do the long-term funding that gives you that security and, and so you can focus on your main job, main work, which is excellence in teaching, but also keep the fiscal ship afloat. We, you know, we've, we've exhausted the $18 billion uh, sustainability fund by the end of next year. Uh, I lived through the 90s. I, I saw those across the board, 5% cuts. 
both to my wife's uh, salary and to mine. I, I don't want to go back there. So again, it, we look at what's happened in the states too. What are the first things that they cut? Social services and education. I don't want that. You don't want that. So I think there's something to be said for sound fiscal management on a go-forward basis, particularly for education and social services. Thanks very much, Ted. And I'm afraid um, we've exhausted the time for this topic, but uh, perhaps have, it can come up in the next, next. Shall we steal a little bit of time then? If you don't. Okay, go ahead, uh, Gary, and then Doug, and then we're going to take some time away from the next one, which is an important subject. Go ahead, Gary. Donna, I actually just wanted to wade in on the issue of the importance of small rural schools. And, and, and it's this point. It's that geography should never be a barrier to beginning, to beginning a great education. And I think that as I've traveled to hundreds of schools during my time as minister, uh, and most recently, I mean, I've been to places like Youngstown, Alberta, a place where there were 12 <coughs> kids that I went to their graduation uh, exercises. Eleven of them were Rutherford scholars. It was an extraordinary uh, teacher named Jeff Hunter who was there, who was doing a remarkable job in, in a very, very small school setting. But my point would be this, is that the outcome that we want is that if you want somebody to be a doctor in Beaver Lodge, you can try and recruit somebody to go to Beaver Lodge to be a doctor, but isn't it better to have somebody who's inspired to become a doctor who's from Beaver Lodge? Because people who are born and raised and live in a community are more likely to go back there uh, and be that important uh, resource for the community that they come from. And so small schools can have a very important role. Technology plays a role in the ability of uh, accessing educational programs that you might not be able to have in a place like foremost Alberta where I've seen kids learning chemistry 30 uh, being taught out of a high school in a place like Medicine Hat and also talking about um, our schools not just as being uh, a place for education but in smaller communities I've seen lots of examples of collaboration where municipal recreational facilities or public libraries or perhaps a Catholic and a public school working together, uh, putting in services that may be social services or health care services, uh, being part of that, of that facility is a really important part to keeping the viability of our small schools uh, Th going thank you, to Gary. small communities. Doug Horner. Uh, Don, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the question you asked, Ted. Um, the reality is we're not poor. The reality is we have an operational reserve and if we say that we can do something for the year, regardless of what happens during that year, the idea behind the operational reserve was to ensure that we kept our promise. There's nothing wrong with us doing that again in the future. And yes, we have to be cognizant about what's going on to our neighbors to the south, but we also shouldn't panic about it just yet because they are gonna come out of it. And I think we can do some good things in this province and lead on a world stage and take advantage of the opportunity that you have as having the strongest financial position of any jurisdiction in the Western Hemisphere, and when the, when the times get tough in the financial markets, it's a good time to buy. So we should be out there right now. Thank you very much. And uh, now we'll move on to the future of the teaching profession. And uh, here's the question. The Alberta Teachers Association has been the professional voice of teachers for over 94 years. The ATA is a unified organization with both union and professional functions representing all teachers in Alberta's public, separate and francophone schools. Do you support the continuation of the association in its current form? And what would your government do to further support the teaching profession in Alberta? First to you, Alison Redford. Thank you. I'm going to tell you that I think in government and in the province of Alberta that the ATA has become pigeonholed. I think that you know what you are. You are an organization that represents your members. You negotiate contracts. You're also terribly involved in professional development. You're here for five days in the middle of the summer talking about the future of education. And I'll tell you that as a government, we need to listen to you. We don't need to just negotiate with you. We need to talk to you, build trust with you, and talk to you about the future of education. And we haven't done that enough. <laughs> the reason that safe communities worked is probably because when I became a minister, I'd never been a minister before. So the first thing I did is I went out and I talked to everyone that I thought was impacted by the policy decisions. And I didn't say to them, based on your role as a member of the ATA negotiating with the government of Alberta, what would your view be? 
I said, tell me about what you think about safe communities. And I did that with stakeholders right across the spectrum. And then you get to have a conversation. You get to have the exciting conversation about what we all want and how we can do it better. And you'll always have those moments where people will say, well, I'd really like to do this, but we can't. Well, why can't we do that? We can do it if we want to. And we can do it if we have the trust to have the conversation and sit down and think not only about how to improve what we have, but how to make it better. So I fully support the role of the ATA as it is now, but I want to have a different relationship with the ATA, and I want you to be able to be more than you've been so far. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Gary Marr. I would be of this view that having seen how different teacher associations work across the country, uh, I'm very supportive of the way that the ATA is structured now. And I don't generally hear about this as a concern of splitting the roles of the ATA among Albertans at large. It does come up in progressive conservative policy conventions from time to time. It has come up, you'll, you may recall, as a private member's bill uh, that was debated during the time that I was minister. And I can tell you that my, I was on the record then, and I would be on the record now, uh, that if it isn't broke, don't fix it. I see, I, thank you, I see, the, I see the value. You see, that was a very respectful short applause, which, which doesn't cut into my time. That was your wife, by the way. Rick says it was my wife. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, do, I do support uh, the idea that uh, as we make changes, recognizing that we've got a, 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 an excellent education system now, and that's not me saying that, that's looking at um, the you know, kind of national and international tests that our students are involved in, uh, that can clearly, measurably demonstrate that we have an excellent system. Uh, there are things that we'll need to ensure that we can change as the globe changes, as the world changes. We also need to change our education system, but I also know from my past experience that we can't do it without collaboration of our key stakeholders. The ATA is one of them. So uh, I will, uh, you know, be focused on improving uh, classroom conditions. I want to be focused on things like wraparound services. I recognize that the needs of kids are complex and that the issue of educability uh, can't be dealt with until you deal with some of the core issues uh, that some of our students come into in our schools. And so focusing on things like work conditions, like uh, allied services that can help teachers uh, will be really important to ensuring that the ATA can work with us collaboratively in moving forward on an even better education system that's relevant for the future. Thank you, Gary. Doug Horner? Um, you know, I think about the relationship that the government of Alberta used to have with the ATA. I think about the relationship that I have in my community with the five school boards and obviously then the great number of teachers that we have doing great work in my constituency. And it's a fabulous relationship because we talk about the issues of special needs, we talk about the issues of classroom size, we talk about the issues of inspiring education. We talk about, boy, wouldn't it be great to get there? And then we get clouded by this dollar problem. We get clouded by the discussion always turns then to, well, we've got to do this contract or we've got to do this issue. Let's settle that piece so that we can recreate the relationship between government and ATA that we should have around trust in building that system that we're all wanting, everybody in this room wants. A system where every child in the classroom is succeeding because the teacher wants it, the parents want it, and we want it. And we're actually doing the things together collaboratively to make that happen. We have missed a tremendous amount of opportunity in the last 15 years, I think, to work collaboratively together to solve some of the issues that we're talking about today. And it's because we've been blocked by this dollar decision. Let's settle that. Let's separate it out. You don't need to separate the ATA to do that. We don't need to advocate for it to do that. All we need to do is sit down in a trusting relationship and talk about it. If it isn't if it broke, as Gary said, you don't need to fix it. What we need to fix is the relationship between us and the ATA. Just like we did with Campus Alberta, just like we did in the BSC process, all of those things, that's the kind of thing that we need to do so that we can work together collaboratively. It's not about your structure. It's about our relationship. 
Thank you, Doug. Ted Morton. I, I don't think I have much to add to that. Uh, I think that the, uh, the, the results that uh, Alberta students achieve uh, uh, nationally and internationally show that the system's working. If the system's working, why go after the ATA on its uh, double function? Um, I think what both uh, Doug and Allison have said is true. We shouldn't just talk to you about, about salaries and working conditions. It should also be about improving education. So let's keep that channel of uh, collaboration and cooperation open, and, or maybe more open than it has been. Although, again, my sense was and is that uh, David Hancock's initiative on inspiring education was a very positive step in that direction, and there was a lot of participation uh, from your membership. So uh, if we got off the path, I think uh, Dave Hancock help, has helped us get back on the path of two-way communications, not just on, uh, on uh, work conditions and, and compensation, but also on the quality of education. So that's clearly a direction I'd like to go. Thank you, Ted. Doug Griffiths? I have also heard colleagues and members of the public on occasion talk about separating the union uh, and the professional services. And to me that seems to come from a point of, of animosity, of antagonism, as though for some reason the government has to do battle with the ATA. And I, I don't know how we address half the issues in education unless ATA is a partner and an advisor in making sure we make the right choices because not, not everyone in government is an expert. For instance, uh, ensuring that we have the best trained, qualified, educated teachers, that we're doing the best professional development. Because again, the reason why we have the best education system is, in the world is because we have the best professional teachers in the world. And the ETA can help advise us on how to address that. But there are longer term issues that I think uh, we can use the ETA to help give us advice on that do damage to the, to the profession. Uh, we have a lot of great young teachers that get educated, get trained, come out, and then there's no jobs. Or they get one-year jobs and then they're left uh, sometimes looking for another career. That does damage to the entire profession and to the reputation that we have as teachers. And so advice from the ATA on how many people we should be graduating and how we make sure that they do wind up in the education system doing what they're perfectly qualified and trained to do would help tremendously. Advising on how to make sure that we have a strong long-term budget is important. Helping us, giving us advice on how we make sure, because no one knows better than teachers on how we make sure we, we keep education strong in communities. We need to utilize the services the ATA, the expertise the ATA has to make sure we make the right decisions. If we continue with the, down the path of thinking it's an, it's an acrimonious relationship, we do a disservice to the people we are all working for, and that's the kids. Thank you, Doug. Rick Worman? Uh, my view is that it's up to the uh, uh, association, to the union, to make their decisions as to uh, keeping their membership contemporary. Uh, it's the ATA that should be responding to the critics. It's the ATA that should be finding ways to make sure that the critics understand the importance of how they uh, conduct their affairs. Um, you know, having been Labour Minister, uh, I fully support the right uh, to organize. Uh, I have a solid record in this regard, uh, having brought in the Labour Code in 1988, and also I was the uh, first minister to institute secret ballots for shop certification. So uh, I am a supporter of it. My father at one time and my grandfathers, two grandfathers before him were members of the union. Uh, I, am a perver I am a conservative, I'm a fiscal conservative, but uh, my experience around my family and, and around uh, my time in labor uh, led me to the conclusion that, uh, that there's, n there's no conflict between the two. So I support that right. And, uh, and I just want to close and, and reiterate, uh, it's not our job to decide uh, whether or not uh, there should be a dual purpose. It's your job to decide, and if the decision is to keep the status quo, then I think it's important you communicate the benefits of that to your organization and to the parents and, and children that you serve. Thank you, Rick. And um, here's a follow-up question from Matthew, who's a principal from Devon, and it's about teacher time. He says, the education environment, mounting student expectations, and shifts in provincial policy are increasing the demands made in our schools. One of the approaches explored in tripartite discussions earlier this year was the restructuring of teacher time and workload to 
to allow more professional development and collaboration. Would you support this direction? First to Rick Orman, then Doug Griffiths. Rick? I think I, I just, I'll recall my last statement. I think it's important that the teachers and the organizations, uh, if, if this is important for them to provide excellence in education, it's important for them to communicate that to the public, the taxpayers, the, the parents, and the students. Uh, far be it from me to dictate whether or not you should have less or more professional time, less or more vacation time, whether you should be uh, dual purpose unions, you're, you're crossed with certification uh, as a teacher and, and as a member of the union. I think those are your issues and uh, it's incumbent upon you to communicate the value and the benefits of your actions. It's not up to government to uh, dictate to you or respond in, in any particular way from, uh, from our taxpayers or from our public. Uh, I'm, I think we have to take the advice and, uh, from you, work with you, help you uh, achieve your goals, and if it's excellence in education, I'm all for it. Doug Griffiths? Well, I mentioned I taught grade five and six social, grade five to nine math, grade five to nine science, grade five to nine computers, <laughs> and on and on and on. It was, we were double and triple graded, and I had one prep class a week. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know, that's, my point isn't that I was alone. My point was that there were a lot of teachers, especially in smaller communities, that were very taxed and didn't get the time for professional development that was needed. Every moment that was ever invested, the small times I got to do it, professional development, paid off substantially in adding to the, the good base of education I got. Because I know that when I came out of of, of the university being a teacher, I didn't have all the answers. I had more questions and I had answers and professional development helped me fill those gaps. So if we, and I said before, we have the best education system in the world because we have the best educated and trained teachers in the world and if we're going to keep the best education system in the world, professional development is a way we keep on top of that. So, yes. Can, can we open up the discussion to whoever would like to join it and, and please deal with this in a little more specific way because I think everybody here would support more professional development. Uh, the problem is, where does the money and time come from within a strapped system? I know in a school that I was uh, a parent on, on the parent council of at one time, teachers were desperate for professional development money and we're looking even to the parent council for that. Where's the money going to come from? Uh, first to Allison and then just show me your hands if you want to respond then to Doug. I, I have to say that uh, when, uh, when I first uh, was told about some of the discussions that were going on with respect to the tripartite discussion, I was disappointed in where we were. And the reason for that is that we were back into this discussion and, and Donna, you've alluded to it, where we're saying, well, if this is something that we think is a good idea, that professional development is a good idea, where are we going to get the money to find it? Now, as Doug would say, that's not what the equation should be, and he's right about that. But I'll tell you, when there is not long-term planning and vision, we end up in a situation where in January, Dave Hancock is trying to sit down with you guys to renegotiate a contract around fiscal parameters, and his commentary is, well, and this is really a good idea because we actually need teachers to have more professional development. That conversation takes place two years ago. So that when we're in that situation, the real conversation can not be, well, we're gonna do this and it's gonna make our education look like, Sing our education system look like Singapore and that's a really good thing. That conversation should have been a conversation that we started having two, three, four years ago to say, we like things in the, edu in the Singaporean education system. We want to develop those. That includes more professional development time for teachers, that the strengths of an education system will not only be about kids sitting in classrooms with teachers in front of them, and that was a big part of where we could have gone with inspiring education. And that's where we have to go, so that we don't come to these crisis points where we're trying to come up with a quid pro quo and then try to figure out some way to sell it to whoever we have to sell it to. That's not responsible leadership in education. Doug Horner. Go ahead, Doug. Oh, thank you, Doug. And I'm, I'm probably going to echo a little bit of what Allison just said here, but the reality is if you want to get something like that done, you have to set the stage for it because we both are in a public position. You're teaching the kids, the parents are watching what you're doing. We've done together not a very good job about telling parents about what's going on in our system. You know, their perception of what you're doing and their perception about what we're doing. It's not about teacher time in the classroom, it's about what's the outcome we're trying to achieve. And Dave made a very good case. Yep. 
The problem was, as Allison said, we were in this trying to hit a percentage. And if we're trying to hit a percentage, guess what? Decision's made. So that's where we have to turn this thing around and say, okay, so if we are going to move down the path of removing the hours of instruction rule so that we can do some other beneficial things, let's have a good discussion about that with your stakeholders and our stakeholders and bring them on side with us because there's a good argument to do it. And it will make a good difference in the classroom and the outcomes. And then let's make it happen. Yeah. Campus Alberta and Alberta Innovates did not happen in six months. It took us two and a half years to get there, yeah. but everybody believed in it when we launched it. The execution was short. The planning and the setup was long. That's how we have to start working together again, and that's what I said. We've missed some really important opportunities because we've been focused on the wrong thing. Let's focus on the right thing. Doug Griffiths. When it comes to funding, I think uh, the problem is not that the system is strapped. The problem is that the system is strapped because of lack of, of sound fiscal management from the province and acceptance, acceptance of some of our fiscal realities. We spend $36 billion a year as a province. We collect $12 billion a year in personal and corporate income tax. We spend $15 billion a year on health care alone. So we have a $24 billion gap that's made up by royalty revenue, cigarette tax, booze tax, gambling, the federal government and royalties. And then we wonder why we get into this vicious cycle. We will not have stable funding for any department and we will be cash strapped if we don't own up and start talking about, conservatives don't believe we spend too much money, I think. The, some say we do, but conservatives believe that we should pay for what we get. And we don't right now in this province. And I would be, I would be happy to pay more taxes if it went to education for my kids. Could I have a show of hands from the candidates who think that we should pay more taxes if it would go into the education system? Just see. <laughs> All right. Um, anybody like to add to the discussion before we move on? Uh, just to say go ahead, this. Go uh, just, to, just to reiterate uh, what both Doug and Allison have said about the need for uh, focusing on the outcomes and having um, predictable, stable funding so that we can plan accordingly. And, and when it comes to the issues of uh, things like uh, professional development, I mean, I've seen the difference that it can make, uh, not just among teachers, but among administrators as well. Whenever you go to a, a really great school, and I've seen many, um, great schools also have, in addition to great teachers, great administrators uh, who put together a team of people that are focused on, uh, on, on the educational needs of their kids. And that often means bringing in parents to be part of the equation uh, because there are many partners that will all have uh, a, a great interest in each of those children succeeding. It's not just teachers, it's parents and administrators as well. And so uh, as you go forward in the idea of how you plan out what pr appropriate professional development uh, will mean, uh, you've also got to have uh, school boards in as part of this equation as an important stakeholder. Thank you very much, Gary. And now we're going to broaden the discussion out just a little bit, but it's still completely related to education. The first uh, has to do with health care, the first topic. And this is um, a question from one of the delegates, Thomas, who's a counselor in Warrenville, and he asks uh, about teachers who are often the first responders to mental health issues in children and youth. In what ways do you see the ministries of health and education working together to address the mental health concerns of our students? And I suspect that Thomas would like as specific an answer as you can provide. We all know we need to work together and bridge gaps that are in the system. Gary Marr, how would you address that question? Well, I can tell you this story. There was a situation when I was education minister and I'd written a, a memo to Halvard Johnson, who was then the health minister, because the, uh, the, the, the Department of Education was paying for very, very expensive um, equipment for kids to be, have mobility in classrooms. And then about 30 days later, there was a cabinet shuffle and I was then the Minister of Health. So I got to answer my own memo. <laughs> and I will say this, in the connection between healthcare and education, there is an inextricable link between the two, that there is a, a linkage, and I believe it is more than a correlation, it is a cause and effect relationship between personal education level 
and personal health status. So if we were to ever hope to bend the curve on our health care expenditures, uh, in my view, uh, investment in education actually makes a great deal of sense. Now, there are many things that can be done uh, in our education system uh, that can actually help bend that curve to promoting um, better outcomes uh, from a social point of view, uh, but also from a health healthcare point of view. And early identification of, of, uh, of issues is one of the things that I think all of us has really talked about. And that would include, for Don's purposes, mental health. And as I've said, you know, Nancy's not a nurse, she's not a mental health professional, but to have those services available uh, in a school uh, to be able to deal with those issues so that you can then deal with the issue of educability of that student and the curriculum and the knowledge and the skills and attitudes you want uh, is really important. When we think about, for example, vaccination of kids, uh, is it easier to take, you know, 550,000 kids and their parents to go to clinics or is it easier to take 250 public health nurses into 1,500 schools? I would argue the latter. And so uh, delivering those services in places where kids actually are would be very, very important. And it's not about spending more money, but it is about redeploying where those services are being done. Thank you, Gary. Doug Horner? Well, uh, Don, uh, you may know my kids all went to Mournville. Um, so I'm hopeful this is not a question about one of my kids. <laughs> um, no, I, I, uh, as I said earlier on, we have to start thinking a little bit differently about what a school can, can, can provide. Uh, Gary touched on it. It is about health care. Health care, the problem we have with health care isn't the system, it's the access to the system. Think of what would happen if you had a registered nurse that was actually floating through the high schools or the junior highs. And I often said, wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if a, uh, a, a registered nurse could talk about choices to some young people in our high schools, could talk about nutrition to some of the parents, the new parents that are coming into the system. Think of what that would do to help us offset some costs down the road. Think of what that investment in early childhood development, early childhood education, class size initiative of K-3, would do for the health care, perhaps even of the family. They're doing a study right now in, in uh, Fort McMurray, where I think it's Mr. Market, is doing the donation. Apple schools. Apple schools. Apple schools, that's right. Thanks, Allison. And it's amazing the results that they're getting in terms of health and education results. Why aren't we leveraging that? Because it's actually benefiting us, the taxpayer, you, the teacher, and me as a parent. Those are the kinds of things that we can do to actually help you deal with the issues that you're facing in the classrooms and in our schools, which are our communities. So I would have no problem at all looking at ways that we could encourage, invest, and fund those kinds of services in our schools. Thank you, Doug. It's, uh, now we're going to switch gears again and, and go to a question from Adam, and it's about economy, finance, and treasury. He's a junior, senior high teacher from Standard, and he asks, Sometimes it makes sense in a personal budget to run a deficit, in particular where the investment is worthwhile, like a post-secondary education or a house. What investments would you run a deficit budget to sustain? What budget lines would you cut in order to sustain a balanced budget? And first to you, Doug Horner, then to Ted Morton, and if we have time, we'd like to hear from the other uh, panelists. Well, you're going to get two different answers coming up. <laughs> I have... I, don't do that, you're wasting my time. Uh, I have uh, started and ran uh, three or four successful businesses in this province and in the United States and in Mexico. I have uh, worked with some of the largest corporations in the United States and Canada. I was an employee with a company called ConAgra, where we actually used to self-finance any of our assets that were larger than a $10 million investment. Every business that's out there leverages its balance sheet. We do not. Every family and household that's out there leverages their balance sheet and their cash flow. We do not. There is a reason, there's a culture that we've driven around this idea that we should not be leveraging our balance sheet. We should not be amortizing an asset that has a useful life of 40 years, over 20 years. We have to start doing that. That's not deficit financing. That's financial responsibility. 
This party has a principle of fiscal responsibility, not fiscal restraint. So when I talk about going back to our values and I talk about compassion, innovation, integrity, commitment to excellence, we should also be talking about those values when we talk about our financial situation. We should be presenting you with an operating budget, full stop. Then we should present you with a capital budget, full stop. And we should show you how we're going to pay for all of that without putting your future at jeopardy, because that's financial responsibility. And there are exceptional examples of things that we should have done, could have done, and should do in the future. Paying $1.4 billion cash for a hospital asset that will be there for 40 years when you could have put half a billion of that into a savings account, could have put half a billion of that into the priorities that we have today, is not the right decision. We, did, we need to make those decisions different. Thank you, Doug. Ted Morton. The, uh, the good news is that uh, if with proper fiscal management, if we stick with the fiscal plan we have, uh, we don't have to do uh, radical cuts to balance the budget. We have a sustainability fund, the, the short-term uh, savings account that, that accommodates the ups and downs of, that are inherent in a, a commodity-based economy like ours. And then, of course, we have the uh, Heritage Savings Trust Fund that Peter Lougheed set up precisely to take uh, energy revenues, which you can only harvest once, so to speak, and put it there and help pay for programs out of the interest that that, that generates. And so in the downturn that we're still coming out of, four deficits in a row, one more to go, the good news for Albertans, but I think particularly the good news for people in the education and social services section is that despite four deficits in a row, we have no new long-term debt. No new long-term debt. And I'm a little surprised given the events of the last uh, couple weeks and, and, and what government debt is doing in, in Europe and in the U.S., both the U.S., both federal and state levels, that uh, Doug would talk uh, pretty cavalierly about running up new debt. Remember, and I, I just be surprised if Doug Griffiths doesn't have something to say about this, debt, <laughs> debt is paid off by, by uh, our kids and our, and our, and our grandkids. Uh, politicians leave, but the kids are still there. And we are spending a lot of the non-renewable resource revenue on current operations. We're already spending future revenues now. So the key is get back to sound fiscal management, build up the sustainability fund again, get the Heritage Savings Trust Fund growing again, and that way we can accommodate the ups and downs, which are inevitable in, in an economy like ours, and, and have stable funding for health, for education, and other social services. That's, I think, the less exciting but uh, sober and prudent approach to uh, government finance. It just, it's pretty depressing the last 10 days that unsound government finance over a period of time creates real chaos and, and greater hardship uh, than the fiscal prudence that I think we've exercised as a government and a party in the past and uh, we're close to getting back to now. Uh, I think we're going to um, allow some of the people who've been addressed to respond and we're going to combine your responses with uh, the next question which has to do with uh, what your position is on raising taxes and or royalties to help address Alberta's deficit or funding shortfalls. But um, I would invite you to keep your answers as brief as possible because it's just more fair to everybody else. So um, how about um, first to the person who uh, was addressed? How about first to Doug Horner, then to Doug Griffiths, and then to our other panelists, uh, Allison, Rick, and Gary? Well, um, to suggest that I, we... I did say your name. Rick, sorry. sorry. To suggest that we don't have long-term debt today is, is a bit of a... Ms. Norman, the infrastructure deficit is as good as a long-term debt as anything else. The other thing is Albertans, Albertans of tomorrow will be using the assets that they're paying for that we're going to build today. So there is a, a, an issue there that uh, I think we could have a very good discussion about. But ideologically, if that's where you want to be, then that's what you'll do. You'll not pay for anything except by way of cash. That's the change that I want to make, folks. You don't, need it now, don't you don't need it tomorrow. Well, I am a fiscal conservative and I don't believe in running up a debt or deficit, but I also grew up on the farm and I know that you don't sell off the cows and then wonder why you have no revenue coming into the farm. You have to invest in the things that are going to grow your economy in the future. And I'm not saying it to you guys because I'm in a room full of teachers. I've said it to a room full of economists. It's stupid to cut funding to education, which is the future of this province. That's... Okay. And it's not just for your benefit. 
Okay, and now um, if, if you could focus your answers more on the question again of raising taxes and royalties, first to Alison Redford, then to Rick Orman, and then we'll hear from the rest of the panel. Go ahead, Alison. Whether we're talking about education or, or the way that we were talking earlier with respect to child mental health, I think that we don't have to raise taxes, and I don't think that at this point in time we need to restructure or amend our royalty framework. Because those, that piece of work for us allows us to have a competitive economy that brings revenue into the province that we can do, use for other things. The question is, how are we using that revenue? And it's pretty easy for politicians to say, oh, we'll be more efficient, we'll be smarter, we'll deliver services better. But there's been a theme in this discussion today about how we've done things well in the past, and we have programs, and we can build on those programs, and we can spend more money in those programs, and we can deliver those programs in different places. That's not what Albertans understand the future looks like. Albertans know that we have resources, and as Doug Griffiths said, what they want to know is that they're getting value for what we're spending money on. And if we look at something, like the way that education is structured right now, the way that we're funding education, and the way that services are provided in schools, we have to know that if we're not prepared to invest in the long term, not only in the education funding as we've seen it in the past, but in terms of how we're addressing some of those root causes of social, future social problems, that we're going to end up having a legacy that's much greater than financial debt. And one of the problems that we have, and one of the reasons that I decided to run, is because when you sit around government decision-making tables, I'll tell you the first thing that falls off the table. It's social programs, it's education. And we can't let that happen. Yep. It's got to be a priority as we move forward, and we have to know that we are able to exist with the revenue that we have if we're prepared to put education and social policy as a priority in future governments. Rick Orman. Well, there will be, uh, under my government, there will be no new taxes. There will be no goods and services tax. Um, it is about how we spend our money. And ladies and gentlemen, you should be asking the people who served in this government not about are you going to raise taxes, but bringing them to account for choices they made other than education. That's the real question here today. Uh, not to continue to allow for the growth of spending in other areas of government and then hope that you get your piece. That's the wrong, sh that, that in my view is the wrong question to be asking uh, the panelists. You know, they have to be accountable for the choices that they've made and, and if those choices had adversely affected our education system, then they are running afoul of uh, what you believe, what I believe, and a principle of our party, excellence in education. So uh, to me, it's about choice, it's about accountability and predictability, and uh, those are the questions you should be asking. Thank you, Rick. And Gary Marr? I will say that uh, raising taxes or changing the royalty is not uh, on my list of priorities. Um, I believe that uh, we can drive are the money that we spend now towards the frontline services where it actually makes a difference. If you don't think that there's a great cost of administration, consider this. Uh, persons with developmental disabilities in this province, these are 9,300 of the most fragile people that we can imagine. Uh, KPMG did a study and they said that for every hundred dollars that goes to a person with developmental disabilities, it costs an additional thirty-one dollars to administer it. So I'm not talking about spending less money on people with PDD. In fact, I want that money to go more into their pockets where it's needed uh, to help them with the services that they require in order to cope with the conditions that they find themselves in. About can we deliver it for uh, you know, less of administra an administration cost? The answer is yes. I would say the same thing of health care and of education. Uh, we need to focus on what it is that the outcomes are, and we need to put our resources in those places. So we, we spend a great deal of money uh, in education. It is a legitimate question to ask, uh, uh, are we spending too much? But I would also say it's an equally legitimate question to ask, are we spending enough? And there are some areas where I would say, uh, when you look at the value equation, not the cost equation, but the value equation, the answer is we can be spending more in some areas in order to get a better outcome. 
Thank you, Gary. And now uh, we'll move on to a question from Dan, who's a science teacher and administrator from Calgary, who asks, it seems like the progressive part of the progressive conservative name has been lost since the days of Peter Lougheed, built roads, schools, and invested in the province's long-term future. In what ways does your platform define you as a progressive and as a conservative? Gary Marr first, and then Alison Redford. The part of me, now, there are some people who will say progressive conservative is a contradiction of terms, and I would say that is not, in fact, the case. The conservative side of me is that uh, government has to help Albertans, not hinder them. It has to be fiscally responsible. It has to be governments that understand that people have dreams and aspirations. Government is there to assist them and then to get out of their way. The part of me that is progressive is to recognize that there are elements, uh, roles for government that are important with respect to, for example, setting standards. Uh, establishing that we have high expectations of our school systems, of our teachers, of our students, of our parents, uh, and that is an important part of growing uh, the economic opportunities for this province. It is about uh, showing demonstration of uh, the importance of the arts and of culture, because ultimately people will come to this province because it's an interesting place to live. And the good news for our province is that people have come from all over this country and all over this world to make a better life for themselves and their, and, and their families in this province. It means that we look after uh, the most disadvantaged people in our society, people with developmental disabilities. And when we think about our Aboriginal people, 7% of the population, they lead in many areas that they do not want to lead in rates of diabetes, sexually transmitted diseases, unemployment, rates of incarceration, non-participation in post-secondary or completion of high school. And we can do better than this. It's important for the future prosperity of our province that all Albertans participate in the future that can be ours and, and the opportunities that we can achieve. Uh, there Thank you, are Gary. elements Thank of being progressive and conservative. Alison Redford. I think we've probably all heard the adage that the value of a society is best reflected in how we care for the most vulnerable. We have people in our society that are vulnerable. I'm not going to let you clap, please, because I want to get this in. We have people in our society who are vulnerable. We know that we have people with different strengths. And we know that as a government that we have a responsibility to support people that need support. Every person in our province, every child in our province, but every adult in our province as well, has to be given the opportunity to excel to the best of their ability. And I will tell you that one of the things that I believe is going to matter in the future is acknowledging that as we've grown from a province of two and a half million people to three and a half million people, and soon to be four and a half million people, that we had better ensure that we remember that value. Because if we don't, we are not going to live in a community that we are proud to be a part of. The role of government will change. Because as we grow as a community, we're going to have to deal with different problems that we haven't faced before. And we can't look back, and we can't think about how we governed and managed public policy 10 or 15 years ago. We have to think about the future. And when I think about my life, and the times that I've lived in this province, and the times that I've been away, we all know that there have been times in this province where we have had governments that haven't had sufficiently progressive values that we've dealt with the issues that we needed to deal with. And we still have the legacies of those decisions. And we can't let that happen again. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. And um, because we are running out of time, we're going to get to our closing statements now. And we'll go first to Doug Horner. Oh, I wanted to answer the last question. <laughs> um, but I'll do it in my closing statement because it, it does actually blend. What are you looking for in the next leader for the Progressive Conservative Party? Because that's what this is. It's a leadership race. By virtue of the honor and the trust and the faith of Albertans, we are the governing party. We have to earn that every time out. We have to remember that that's the case. I had the blessing of growing up listening to Peter Lougheed and my dad talk about what it means to be progressive conservative. And I, t I started my opening comments talking about a teacher in Glenman that I asked the question about what does he think progressive conservative is? And we have to redefine for our party and for Albertans what it means to be progressive conservative. 
I am not a Unite the Right candidate. I am a Unite the Progressive Conservatives candidate because I believe in those values, I believe in those principles, and I believe that the change that we want to make is to change the way we make decisions so we make them through those lenses of the values of compassion for those in need. Talking about building for the future of our province and the future of our the future economies, the future infrastructure, the future arts and culture, and to lead on a world stage because we have an opportunity, folks, that is unrivaled by any jurisdiction in the world today. When you think about where Alberta sits with energy, environmental solutions, food and fiber, healthcare innovations, and a cutting edge educational system, K-18, this is a generational opportunity for us. And we are going to have to invest to make it happen. And the values and principles of the Progressive Conservative Party do not get old and they don't get stale. But if we ignore them, then we will be. And I ask you to join me on September 17th to redefine this party the way that it should be, progressive, conservative, with the values that we've talked about today. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> Gary Marr. Ever since I bought a one-way ticket from Washington, D.C. to return to Alberta on March the 10th of this year, I've traveled extensively throughout the province. And wherever I've gone, whoever I've talked to, whether it's been in cities, towns, or hamlets, or villages, whether it's been urban or rural, whether it's been north or south, whether it's been people from the Aboriginal community, the Chinese community, those who come from South Asia or from anywhere across Canada, or Albertans who have been here with their families for over 100 years, or those who that have been here for 100 days, uh, I will say that near the top of everybody's list is a good education for their child. And they recognize that their future personal stakes are high uh, and can be achieved through, through education. And so what I say to you is that the opportunities in the world are great. The world will demand what we make, what we produce, what we upgrade in this province, be it energy, be it food, be it forestry products. Uh, Albertans understand that these are our opportunities, but in order to achieve them, we have to ensure that our children are armed with the kind of skills, attitudes, knowledge, cultural awareness, uh, global uh, awareness, uh, digital literacy, all of those skills are necessary for our kids to be uh, an important part of the future prosperity of this province so that they can be privately happy and publicly useful. And so I will lead a government that will listen to you carefully, work with you for the benefit not only of teachers and education, but for our young people, our students, our parents, for our province. And you have my respect, you have my ear, and you have my commitment. And that is why I ask you to join my team in supporting me and voting for me on September the 17th uh, and uh, for a better Alberta, for, for a better future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Alison Redford. Thank you all for being here today. In my opening remarks, I talked about trust, and I talked about wanting to build a trusting relationship. Inspiring education allows us to begin that process, and that's what we now have to work on. I think the Education Act that was introduced this spring wasn't good enough. It didn't reflect everything that we'd all worked on. It didn't reflect what you talked about. And we have the opportunity to do more of that. We have to put students first. We have to put resources in the classroom. We have to have a long-term agreement with you that will create a simple labor agreement and peace so that we can move on to everything we've been talking about today. We know that we have to change the foundations of our system. And we don't have to be afraid of that. We have to be optimistic and positive and confident about that, and we have to do it together. And we can do that by building that foundation. And that will come from respect. I want to earn your trust. And when I've earned that trust, we can begin to implement those plans for change. We have to focus on individual students. We have to have stable and predictable funding. And as I've said before, we have to think about what the resources should be in the classroom and ensure that they are there. I have consistently talked about three things that matter to this province. We have to have a vibrant and diverse economy, and we understand how education fits into that. Albertans have to be able to make a good living. We have to support basic needs, K-12 education, post-secondary education, and protecting our kids. 
And we have to ensure that we have a strong, culturally vibrant community where we all feel proud to be part of this. That is my vision. My values are about good, strong government, listening, consultation, sound fiscal planning, and building for the future. And today I ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Rick Gorman. Thank you. Uh, j just on the issue of uh, are we progressives and are we conservatives and are, are, are they mutually exclusive? Uh, actually, I know quite a bit about the other candidates at this table and I can assure you that if you visited their websites you would see where they stand on social policy and where they stand uh, on the fiscal side of government and it's important that you do that. That was part of my op opening remarks. Uh, if you were to go to my website uh, you would see statements uh, referring to homelessness, addiction treatment, Aboriginal and Métis issues, seniors, and arts and culture. So even though I am a fiscal conservative, uh, there is a, I have a very big place in my heart for the social side of government. And I think that's why we're all here, because we find the tent of progressive conservatives is the place that we want to be for all of those good reasons. Uh, you've heard many good ideas here today, uh, and I should remind you that you've got four cabinet ministers at this table uh, who in the last six years were around when the decisions were made. And you are hearing quite a different story today than what you would read from their actions. This government had a chance to earn your trust, and if you are satisfied with the status quo, there are five eminently capable other candidates at this table that can lead your government into the next decade. If you want predictable, trusting government that lives up to its commitments, change you can trust, should join the Rick Orman campaign. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. Doug Griffiths. Well, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, before you is a group of incredibly talented people, any one of whom is fit to lead this party. I know. I... <laughs> Seems to be some disagreement there. <laughs> I get asked by students all the time, because I still love going into the classroom and talking to students as many opportunities as I get. I get asked, what do you have to... What qualifications do you have to have to be an MLA or to be the Premier? And I, they say, do you have to have a university degree or be famous or something? And I tell them, no. All you have to do is have a vision of what you think this province is capable of. Be brave enough to stand up and tell people about it, and then make sure you surround yourself with people smart enough to help you get it achieved. That's it. That's as simple as it is. Now, 56% of the people of this province are under 40. It's an interesting little stat. Their issues are around education for themselves and for their kids, the environment for secure long-term prosperity, and quality health care for their kids and for their parents. Didn't mean to point at you, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> my, my family and I live those issues. You know, some people have indicated that I'll be a great premier somewhere down the road. Uh, I don't know if I'll be around down the road to still run for Premier because my goal is not to put Premier on my resume. My goal is to build a better Alberta for my kids. And I... <laughs> my kids are five and two. And I will be the first Premier in this province in 26 years that has had kids in school. Peter Lougheed was 38 when he took over the party. I'm 38. Peter Lougheed was progressive, I'm progressive. My notion now is not to think about my retirement. It's about what I'm going to do to help build a better Alberta for my kids. That's why I'm running. I know you have on here that uh, the future, it's why teachers teach. It's sometimes why they run for Premier, too. Thank you, Doug. Ted Morton. The name of uh, Peter Lougheed uh, keeps coming up as sort of the uh, standard by which to, uh, to uh, measure pro progressiveness in the Progressive Conservative Party. And it's appropriate, this is the 40th anniversary of, uh, of the PC party forming government under Lougheed. What's the biggest, most important legacy of the Lougheed government? It's the Heritage Savings Trust Fund. That was based on vision and foresight that our non-renewable resource revenues by definition run out over time. And so he set up a fund where 50% of those revenues would go into this long-term savings account so that as 
resources decline and revenues decline, we can still, still sustain the quality of life that Albertans have become accustomed to. Today, what percentage of non-renewable resource revenues are automatically set aside into the Heritage Savings Trust Fund? Zero. Zero. And so I would suggest that part of what is being progressive is understanding the economic foundation of a just society. Allison's right. The quality of a society is measured by do we take care of people who can't take care of themselves. I think that was Peter Lougheed's vision. I think that's been at the core of, of this party for, for 40 years. But to do that requires financial support to do it. And I think a prudent savings program set up by Peter Lougheed is one of the ways that we sustain that over time. And just one example, again, coming back to education, not specifically your issue, but certainly on your radar, is post-secondary, after K to 12. And I would point, I would encourage you to take a look at my website, look at the post-secondary tuition tax credit that I've proposed, uh, giving students up to $20,000 back in tuition they spend on themselves for any sort of post-secondary education. If they finish, if they finish the program, stay in Alberta, go to work and pay taxes, they can get all of their tuition back over a seven-year period up to a maximum of $20,000. That's the kind of, I think, progressive education, progress, progressive investment in education that a group like ATA would welcome, and I hope you'll think about that as you uh, participate in this leadership race. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. And thanks to all six of our candidates today. Thank you. Now I'd like to welcome the Vice President of the Alberta Teachers Association, Sharon Armstrong. Sharon? Good morning. On behalf of the Alberta Teachers Association, I would like to thank the leadership candidates for making this leadership forum a priority in their busy schedules. We appreciate your attendance and your sharing your positions on various issues with us this morning. And we have uh, some thank you cards and some gifts for you that we'd just like to distribute. Lunch. Box lunch. <laughs> lunch. Thank you. Thank you. It's not pizza. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rick. Okay. I want the pepperoni and cheese, please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Doug, why don't you say thanks on behalf of all of us for this? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Donna for her very capable and able moderating of this session. And I love that broadcast voice. A strong public education system is necessary for the continued prosperity of our province. And this is an opportune time for teachers to engage politicians on issues of importance to education. At this time, I would like to clearly state the ATA's position when it comes to politics. The ATA is nonpartisan. The ATA does not endorse any one political party. However, in stating that, I do encourage each and every one of you to get politically involved. It is your right and it is your responsibility as a citizen of Alberta. I would like to also take this opportunity to reiterate what President Henderson advocated in her speech on Monday evening become politically involved. Buy a membership and have your voice heard in the progressive conservative leadership race. And please do go back to your school and encourage every other teacher in your school to buy a membership and to have their voice heard also. 
Please remember that tomorrow evening from 4 till 7 p.m. in the Max Bell Auditorium, or just outside the Max Bell Auditorium in the atrium, the Liberal leadership candidates will be available for a meet and greet. We would encourage you to take that opportunity to meet with them also, and we encourage you to buy a membership in the Liberal Party and to vote for the leader of the next Liberal uh, government or party. <laughs> government, sorry, of the next Liberal Party. <laughs> I better not uh, jump the gun here. <laughs> We don't need advice on this one. <laughs> a final thank you to all the leadership candidates. And as teachers, I think that we recognize the commitment that each and every one of you are making and putting your names forward in this leadership race. And we appreciate that and we acknowledge that. And I would ask you to join with me once more in a round of applause to thank the candidates for coming this morning. And just for some logistics before you leave, uh, we will begin our next session at 11.20 with an address by Dr. Thomas. And we thank the public and we thank the media for attending this first session with us this morning. But the next session is a closed session, and so we would ask that the public and the media excuse themselves for the auditorium, from the auditorium for the 11.20 session. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. That was great. They're really good. Yeah, they are. Great idea. Thanks again. Thank you very much. No, it's very.